So I realized that last video got cut off, so I'm going to pick up where uh, it left off. And looking at, at the slow cadence of the work songs as a form of, of resistance to the institution of slavery. Uh, obviously, the importance of music and the, the communal element of music and dance is going to be a very important part of African-American culture. Uh, it's interesting because some of these things went underground uh, during the, the period of slavery, particularly the ring shout, which was a, a, an African tradition of uh, call and response and moving in a circle, um, which, which was a way in which uh, the, the kind of conjuring of the spirit was, was happening. Uh, it was connected to, to African animism, which literally was the connection to the spirit and nature. So the, the musicians would, would, would uh, come up with some form of percussion and then call and response, and the dancers would respond, uh, dancing in a counterclockwise way. And it's interesting that the ring shout uh, reappears in Reconstruction after the Civil War is over. All of a sudden, uh, this form of dancing and this form of cultural expression uh, comes back again. And white people are shocked because they, they, they uh, hadn't seen it before. It had been happening, you know, in the woods, it had been happening in secret. But all of a sudden it comes out into the open and it's seen very much as a kind of an expression of the African-American experience. So here's an example of it. Um, this is the Macintosh uh, County Shouters. You can see the rhythm here, the stick and the, and the clapping, and there's the dancing, counterclockwise, shimmying, moving into a line. So that's just a little piece of it. But I think what's interesting about it is that uh, if you if you look at, at the way in which uh, that particular, uh, expression happens. You can, you can hear, you can hear the percussion. You can hear, you can hear the back and forth between the musicians and the dancers. And again, you get the sense that this is, this is very much, uh, part of a tradition that, uh, comes from Africa. The same thing you're going to see with, with, um, black fraternity step traditions. Um, and this, these, these step traditions come out of the historically black colleges and universities starting in the 1940s, still very much part of the culture. Um, and it's interesting, the synchronized interplay of hands and feet, it's just like the ring shout. Uh, and it also incorporates some of the chants and hollers that you hear coming out of slavery. The chants and hollers were the way the workers in the fields would communicate with each other. So the holler literally was a form of, um, it was like a shout. Um, just like, like the ring shout was a shout, but this is even more uh, improvisational. It combines kind of spoken word, dancing, syncopated rhythm, uh, and a lot of different cultural elements. So I'll play a little piece of this. This is from the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. I don't remember what college this is from, but uh, here we go. Okay, that's a small example of it. Uh, but what you can hear is the vocalization, uh, the dance response, uh, movement, syncopation, um, that kind of almost militaristic rhythm uh, is 
uh, expression of, of the identity of the fraternity, identity of the group, um, but also using your body as an instrument and using, using your body both as an instrument, both as the form of the, of the rhythm and then the expression of the rhythm through the, through the dance. So that's, those are two aspects of, of uh, uh, African culture that come through in, in the traditions. Uh, the other one, of course, is hip hop and rap. Now, rap and hip hop, we'll talk more about this later in the course. This is going to come out of African traditions of the griot. And the griot were the oral historians of Africa. They usually were kind of like the court jester, but they were very accomplished musicians who would tell stories of the community, would tell stories of the tribe, would tell stories of the leader and sing the praise of the leader. There was also kind of oral combat that, it, that happened within this, where griots from different tribes would go up against one another. And this is going to lead us to another tradition called the dozens, which uh, emerges in, in, the, in, the, in the context of slavery. And the rapper KRS-One here um, talks about the origin of the dozens uh, within the slave context. get their notoriety through battling, meaning that back in the days, we used to call it the dozens. Slaves were sold one by one unless there was a defect. Their leg was hurt, her arm was uh, severed, mental issues, maybe sick. Those people were sold um, in a dozen. So slaves would start going back and forth with each other saying, uh, well, your head's bigger than your neck, and that makes you a lollipop. Ah, your mother is so this, I can do that. Ah, and everybody would laugh at you, which then eventually became the dozens. So the idea of battling coming out of this tradition called the dozens, where you verbally attack your opponent and your opponent verbally attacks you until somebody breaks down and either wants to fight, cries, whatever it is, or, or a judge deems the battle won by either opponent. This trickles over into rapping. It was Zulu Nation that first brought up the idea of we don't have to shoot at each other or beat on each other or, or this. We can actually use this tradition of the dozens to actually have verbal warfare through art. So notice here uh, in this explanation that K what KRS-One is saying is that Essentially, hip hop emerges in opposition to gang culture in the 70s and 80s uh, in the Bronx in New York um, as a way to symbolically uh, incorporate conflict. And this is exactly what happened in Africa, where you had musical and oral conflict that would prevent uh, intertribal conflict. So, again, an ancient African cultural trend coming into modern African-American culture. Now, a lot of African-American uh, music, whether it's jazz, blues, uh, but also uh, church music comes from call and response. So the call and response tradition is usually rhythmic and then somebody sings and somebody responds. So if you look at this, this here's an example of a gone in call and response um, Hear the background rhythm. So what you see here is, again, the call and response within, uh, there's one person calling, one person responding, and then the rhythmic humming and, and responding in the background with the percussion going as well. So what you can see here is the combination of percussion, call and response. So if you look at this within the church traditions and within the jazz tradition, you see the same thing. So again, not going to sound the same, but it's the same pattern. So here we go. Call Call. Response.
I wish we had more time to listen to that because it's outstanding. But again, if you if you listen to that, you have the lead singer calling and the chorus responding and all the clapping coming in to syncopate uh, within that. And if you really listen carefully, you start hearing uh, call and response between the organ player and the drummer. The it's, it's, it's a conversation and that's what jazz is. We'll get more into detail on that. It's really interesting once you start hearing it. And once you start hearing call and response, you start listening to pop music in a totally different way because it's in so many forms of the music that you're used to listening to. Now, because African American culture is so verbal and because of the, the verbal element of it uh, was always about challenging power. Uh, Br'er Rabbit, a famous uh, story, Uncle Remus was a, a storyteller that came off the plantation. The story of Br'er Rabbit was, again, a rabbit who was always outsmarting the fox. Now, the fox sort of represented the plantation owner um, and the Br'er Rabbit always used it, his, his, intelligent, his intelligence and his caginess to uh, effectively uh, escape. And so constantly Br'er Rabbit is using turns of phrase and uh, uh, different kinds of trickery to get what he wants. And it's really interesting. The message here obviously is if you're telling a story to children, the idea is you can use language to, uh, to free yourself, but you can also use it to hide, particularly in forms of oppression. So when you look at, at this concept of signifying monkey, uh, same sort of thing, the narrative uh, tradition is so, so signifying is, is again sort of rapping and use, using verbal wordplay uh, to, to signify, right? To, to, to show the spirit. And that spirit, again, is part of that African culture. We saw it in the, in the circle shout. Uh, we see it in, in spoken word poetry. Um, uh, so to signify is to show the spirit. Now, finally, and I wish we had a little more time to go into this, we have uh, all of the various cultural musical forms of opposition. But then, of course, we have the literal forms of opposition, and and these are going to be important moments for African Americans. Which is, while whites will focus on the continuation of the institution of slavery, uh, African Americans will focus on the opposition to it. So, two major uh, forms of slave rebellion: the first by Gabriel Prosser in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Gabriel Prosser was a, a young blacksmith. Uh, who was very intelligent, also very strong. Um, he was, uh, because he worked in the, in the area of downtown Richmond, he had access to the free black community, to the urban enslaved community, and even to some of the local plantations. And he begins to establish this large, large network of people. And he had hundreds of people uh, preparing for a, a large uh, revolt which he saw as he was inspired by what happened in Haiti, um, where you had basically the entire country rose up against the French and, and, and killed off the plantation owners and took control. He thought he could do the same thing and very closely got away with it, except for at the last minute, a few of uh, the, the slaves in the plot uh, turned against him. Uh, he was, he was uh, captured, but not after uh, or not before other other uh, slaves were hiding him. There was a whole effort to, to basically um, make this revolt happen. Same thing ha happens with Denmark Vesey um, in Charleston in 1822. He also was um, uh, a, a literate and uh, person that had a lot of connections within the urban community. So he, both of these people were, were working within, within the networks of, of the African-American community to try to overthrow the institution of slavery. Obviously, Nat, Nat Turner, another important rebellion in 1831, the killing of plantation owners, including his own plantation owner, as a form of moral opposition to the institution. So Nat Turner becomes uh, symbolic of the literal violent action against uh, the institution of slavery. So all of these things, whether they're literal opposition or cultural opposition, represent the African-American agency.